Hey guys, how you all doing and thing? You understand what I see? And I'm back here with another reaction for you all. And someone in the comment section suggested that this might be something of interest to me. And it's about Frederick Douglass going to England, uh, Ireland. Sorry, you know what I mean. So this is a story of him going to Ireland. Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what he did while he was in Ireland, and quite possibly what impact he had on the people of Ireland or they had on him. Let's go. In September of 1838, Frederick Douglass, who was a slave about the age of 20 years old, dressed in a sailor's uniform that had been given to him by a free black woman named Anna Murray. Frederick then boarded a train in Baltimore, Maryland, heading north. He had with him a document called a Seaman's Protection Certificate that was generously given to him by a free black dock worker named Samuel Fox. It was a required document for people of color to move within slave states, and it entailed grave risk, both for Douglas and for Samuel Fox. 24 hours later, after travel by train, ferry, and steamboat, Douglas arrived in New York City and for the first time in his life knew the feeling of freedom. Douglas said it was a moment of the highest excitement I have ever experienced. But can you really imagine after living like that, like subhuman, to get to a place where you're free, that kind of that kind of that kind of feeling is, has has to be like the greatest feeling in the world. It's kind of like an immigrant coming from a war-torn country where they've been persecuted and you know and prosecuted, and. Uh, coming to going to Europe or coming to America or even like traveling within the continent of Africa to a freer country in Africa or uh, in the Caribbean where some people from the smaller islands, you know, where they were struggling, moved to a bigger island like Trinidad. I mean, back then, and I'm talking about that's back in the day. Now all the smaller islands are pretty much caught up with the bigger islands. But I wouldn't say I had the same feeling when I came here. So I don't know how that would feel because I just came here to get an education, to tell you the truth. And uh, because we didn't have any universities on the island. But can you imagine that feeling of landing somewhere where you know you are at least a little bit freer? Because, I mean, it, it, freedom as, as, as far as being free from slavery, but then, of course, there's there, there's not there wasn't a real freedom of being segregated against and stuff like that. I'm assuming there was still some of that because there was still some of the mindset. The mindset haven't changed and so it didn't change in some people. And it still haven't changed in some people today. You know, there's still the remnants of what was taught to people about black people or about Irish people or about, you know, just any minority or even about poor white people. It's, it lingers and people will be treated, you know, less than stellar when they go certain places. But when you take into consideration only the, the conditions the slaves were under to land in a place where those conditions are like against the law, pretty much. God, can you imagine that, that, that feeling, boy? It had to be surreal a bit. Frederick Douglass didn't stay in New York long. Because the city was full of bounty hunters searching for runaway slaves, See? sympathetic people guided him further north for greater safety. But before leaving New York, Frederick sent for Anna Marie, and with the help of his new friends, Frederick and Anna were married. They quickly traveled on to New Bedford, Massachusetts, where they settled for four years. It was here that Frederick, whose original name was Frederick Augustus Washington Bailey, became Frederick Douglass to further distance himself from the dangers of his slave past. Frederick and Anna were welcomed into a Quaker community in New Bedford, and Douglass found work as a laborer. Douglass was also introduced to William Lloyd Garrison's publication, The Liberator, which galvanized him. You know, you know, you know what baffles me about, the, about a lot about this? I mean, he found solace in a Quaker 
commune or building or whatever, which the Quakers are very religious. So why are we going back? Because I'm telling you, I went to a, a religious school and that, that was a trip there. That was a trip. Granted, it, where, where the place was, I guess that was prevalent there, but the first time I, I faced racism and it was supposed to be like this uber Christian school. But to this day, that is the most racism that I've ever encountered in my life was at that, that place where I was. That religious Christian school. It was bad. He said, my soul was set on fire. Its sympathy for my brethren in bonds, its scathing denunciations of slaveholders, its faithful exposures of slavery, and its powerful attacks upon the upholders of the institution sent a thrill of joy through my soul, such as I have never felt before. Three years after arriving in Bedford, Douglas attended an anti-slavery convention in Nantucket, where he was encouraged to speak. Although nervous and reluctant to address a group of white people, the account he gave of his experiences of slavery was so moving and compelling that he was instantly recognized as a natural spokesman for the cause of abolitionism. Now, before this go on, I know I'm doing a lot of videos about slavery. They were suggested to me. I'm not going, oh, you know, I've got to do it because, you know, we, I learned about a lot of that stuff in high, in, in high school back on the island, you know, and, and, and just being around Rastafarians who study all that stuff. These videos were suggested to me. I didn't know Frederick Douglass went to Ireland. That's quite, quite interesting to me. So, you know, and you get the full story when you look at your own, you go out and you do your own research and stuff like that. So, what's suggested to me? William Lloyd Garrison hired him as an anti-slavery lecturer and Douglas began a career as one of the most inspiring and storied spokesmen ever to fight slavery and injustice. As an itinerant lecturer on abolitionism for the American Anti-Slavery Society, life could be difficult for Frederick. He was often expected to travel and live in segregated conditions, which he refused to do. In some locations, especially in the West, he was met by pro-slavery mobs. In 1843, Douglas was beaten up and his hand was broken. And then there were those who refused to believe that the extraordinarily eloquent and well-mannered black man speaking to them had actually been a slave. In response, Douglas wrote... And here's a question. Who is, who is beating him up? Because you, you, you have to know it's ordinary people that, that's being, you know, manipulated by rich people because they, they ain't getting no gain from the slave trade. They just like dislike an old dude because of what they heard. So, if they hired henchmen, they're not going to hire other rich people to do their dirty work for them. They're going to hire the poor people who need the money to do their dirty work for them. And they have to like let them think that these people, or him in particular, is not worthy of being treated humanely, period. And that's crazy that poor people would allow themselves to be the ones help and prosecute other poor people. But then again, if they don't see them as human beings, it's easy to do that. His autobiography, titled, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass, an American Slave, written by himself. It was published in May of 1845 and became an immensely popular bestseller, both in the US and in Europe. But with the publication and admission of his slave background, Frederick Douglass was no longer safe, even in the free North. His friends and abolitionist associates urged him to travel abroad. So he departed from Boston in August of 1845, headed across the Atlantic. Several weeks later, he arrived in Dublin, Ireland by way of Liverpool to begin 20 months of touring, writing, and lecturing throughout Ireland and Britain. Wow. 
This was also the time when Ireland's Great Famine had its start. During his time away from America, Frederick was, for the first time in his life, dependent entirely on himself for his own well-being. He was helped by the Society of Friends, also known as Quakers, and other anti-slavery groups, but without William Lloyd Garrison's regular sponsorship. Douglas now arranged his own speaking schedule and itinerary, and raised funds for travel by selling copies of his narrative, including newly published Irish and British Isles editions of the book. Frederick savored the experience of living as a free person and gained maturity and self-reliance. He wrote, I breathe and lo, the chattel becomes a man. I employ a cab. I am seated beside white people. I reach the hotel. I enter the same door. I am shown into the same parlor. I dine at the same table and no one is offended. I find myself regarded and treated at every turn with the kindness and deference paid to white people. Douglas also gained confidence to speak about more than descriptions of life under slavery and began to explore a wider range of topics. But he quickly discovered through some early missteps the wisdom of avoiding debate on especially charged subjects with which he had little direct experience, such as the tensions between Catholics and Protestants. He finished his tour of Ireland and England as someone who had made a personal evolution. He wrote, I can truly say I have spent some of the happiest moments of my life since landing in this country. I seem to have undergone a transformation. I live a new life. In December of 1846, a group of women abolitionists led by Anna Richardson in England took steps to purchase Frederick Douglass's freedom from Hugh Auld and his brother Thomas, who still owned Frederick. Wow. The amount given to purchase him was 150 pounds sterling. It was this fact that finally allowed Frederick Douglass to return to the United States as a truly free man without the threat of recapture. So he wasn't free. Douglass sailed back to the United States in April of 1847 and moved with Anna and their children to Rochester, New York. There he began writing and editing a newspaper titled The North Star, whose motto was, Right is of no sex, truth is of no color. God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. The following year, the first women's rights convention was held at Seneca Falls, New York, and Frederick, the only African American to attend, made a supportive address and signed the Declaration of Sentiments in favor of women's rights. Wow. That's Through his cool. newspapers and lectures over the next 15 years, Frederick Douglass became one of the most well-known and respected black Americans. He wrote his second book titled My Bondage and My Freedom in 1855. He and Anna had five children, four of whom survived. And after the start of the Civil War in 1861, Douglass worked to promote the freedom, welfare, and rights of his fellow African Americans. In 1863, Abraham Lincoln invited Douglas to confer about how to end the prolonged tragedy of the Civil War and how to end slavery in the process. They also discussed ways to attract more Southern black men to fight for the North and the need to compensate them. In the years after the war, Douglas was appointed to several political positions, including U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia, and later Minister Resident and Consul General to Haiti. Towards the end of his life, Frederick visited his former slave master, Thomas Ald. Frederick wrote, I had by my writings made his name and his deeds familiar to the world in four different languages. Yet here we were, after four decades, once more face to face, he on his bed, aged and tremulous, drawing near the sunset of life, and I, his former slave, United States Marshal of the District of Columbia, holding his hand and in friendly conversation with him in a sort of final settlement of past differences. It was a dramatic and profoundly significant change of circumstances for both men. In 1882, Anna Douglas, Frederick's wife of 44 years and mother of their five children, died. Two years later, Douglas remarried, this time to Helen Pitts, who was white. But there was opposition from both family and friends, and Douglas said, 
They would have had no objection to my marrying a person much darker in complexion than myself, but to marry one much lighter and of the complexion of my father rather than of my mother was, in the popular eye, a shocking offense, and one for which I was to be ostracized by white and black alike. Perhaps to escape, in 1846, Frederick and Helen began a tour of Europe in the British Isles. Helen returned home before Frederick did, and he revisited Dublin, Ireland. While there, he spoke in favor of Irish home rule. Eight years later, on February 20th, 1895, Frederick Douglass attended a meeting of the National Council of Women. Susan B. Anthony walked into the stage where he addressed the audience. Later that evening, when he was back at home, Frederick died of a heart attack. He was buried in Rochester, New York, next to his first wife, Anna. Few men have had such a deep impact on American life and culture, especially the relationship between white people and people of color. Frederick Douglass observed that in a country as diverse as ours, there should be no rich, no poor, no high, no low, no white, no black, but common country, common citizenship, equal rights, and a common destiny. He lived his life in dedication to the principle that right is of no sex, truth is of no color, God is the father of us all, and we are all brethren. See, this is why we need to watch history. This was powerful. This was powerful here. Now, I know of Frederick Douglass, but you know, to have this a succinct understanding of the man's life, this is the first time that I've actually sat down and, and uh, yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed this. I hope you guys enjoyed this also, you know what I mean? I'm going to leave a link in the description to this video, as usual. And uh, if you all enjoyed this also, drop a like on the video for me and thing, you know what I mean? Uh, let everybody see. Let everybody know the history. You understand what I mean? You know, it's kind of like, okay, when you have like days like Martin Luther King Day and you have the kids stay off of school, I don't think they should be staying off of school. What I think they should be doing is going to school and learning about people like Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King. And even the ones like Malcolm X that people don't agree with, let's just get all sides taught. Let the kids make up their mind, or you know, or the, or the young people make up their mind what the vibe is that's going on. That's what I think they should do in holidays like that, instead of just having these kids go home and sit there, you know, and, and do nothing. Educate them. <laughs> Educate them. Educate them. That's some silly joke there. But anyway, man, you all take care of each other, all right? Remember, go out there and love a stranger. Cool runnings.